Thanks, guys. Two microphones is very, very odd. So I, I participate in the digital scavenger hunt thing, but then that would mean I'd have to install that Insta whatever crap on my phone, and I'm just not going to do that. Um, the, the other thing that I caught from that is apparently Chris Lem is going to be on American Idol, and I think that's going to be awesome. You guys should all tune in for that. Um, this is a table of two test suites. It's basically just a backstory of how we do unit testing inside WordPress. And it's called a table of two test suites because it's more a reflection on the evolution of code as far as WordPress is concerned and also how my own code has evolved over time because in the beginning it was not the best of code. It definitely was the worst of code. And every time I go back and look at it, I cry and want to give up and become a clown. So. Um, meta information for this presentation, everything is open, slides will be posted somewhere on Twitter, my website, whatever, they're already floating around the interwebs somewhere. I don't reserve any rights, you guys can do whatever you want to with this content. Take it, remix it, reuse it, resell it, I don't care, whatever you want. I'm Eric Mann on Twitter, if you guys ever need anything, if you need to follow up or if you have any questions. Like I said, in the beginning, it was the best of code, it was the worst of code. Who here learned how to write code looking at WordPress core? I am so sorry for each and every one of you. I learned how to write code by looking things up online. When I first got started, I was in graduate school studying to be a marketer. I was studying business. Never taken a computer course in my life. Nobody could Google me. Whenever I'd get into a job interview, everything would be going super well up until about the day before my final interview, and then I'd get a frantic, sorry, we're not interested, phone call. And I asked, well, well why are you not interested? I, I thought we had this really good rapport going. I know my stuff and everything. They said, well, we tried to look you up on Google. We found a guy on death row in Arizona. We found a porn star in New York, a lawyer in California, and some guy who lives in the woods and like brews coffee out of his own urine. I don't think you're any one of those people. And because we can't find you on Google, we don't think you're a good fit for our marketing department. So I was stuck without a job, without any job prospects, went to my career coach, and he told me, you need a website. I'm like, great. How do I do that? Like, well, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe you should go back to school and learn how to build websites. Like, no, I've, I've paid for undergrad. I've paid for graduate school. I'm not going back to school again. I'm done with this school thing. I just want to get started. So I started looking things up. I asked a friend for some advice, and he said, you should learn PHP. I have no idea what that acronym stands for. He, he said it stands for PHP Hypertext Processor. But that makes no sense. <laughs> so I, I stopped trying to think about it too hard and just said, okay, I'll learn how to write this code. I'll pull everything together. And I had my first website. Apparently, I did a really good job of faking it because that website I built for myself got me a contractor job building a website for somebody else who tricked me into using WordPress. I was going to use a completely different CMS. He wanted to use WordPress. I thought WordPress was a joke because it was just for blogs. It wasn't going to be a good fit for his platform. So I said, no, we're going to use this other framework. He said, OK, fine, whatever. You're the engineer. That's great. Come down to my end of town on Saturday, and I'll take you to lunch. I'm like, sure. Sound, sounds fine. I'm broke. Free lunch is going to be great. Lunch happened to be the breakout session at the first WordCamp Portland. So I ended up learning WordPress, whether I wanted to or not. Ended up using it. And it was fantastic. I learned how to write PHP code. I had dynamic variables. I had server includes. I had all of this great stuff where I could build a website. I submitted a bunch of tickets on track and was summarily dismissed from ever contributing to WordPress core because I had no idea what I was talking about and basically learned how to code by looking at the jumble of spaghetti mess that WordPress was back in 2007 and saying, wow, this must be the pinnacle of engineering. It runs 10% of the internet. This must be great. It was crap. So then I moved on from PHP and joined the Microsoft world. I went from WordCamps where you paid $15, $20, $25 to go to a week weekend conference with all sorts of sessions to the Microsoft world where you paid $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 to go to a single day conference where everybody talked above your heads and you didn't get any information out of the conference whatsoever. And I figured that's where we should be. Obviously, WordPress is not the way to go. So I started focusing on Microsoft code, .NET code, and writing in C Sharp, and F Sharp, and Visual Basic, and all sorts of these other languages that the professionals were using, because nobody takes JavaScript and PHP seriously, because they're not professional languages. And the Microsoft community was doing testing. Everything had to be unit tested. And I looked at that, and I said, wow, th this is really interesting. Why would I write twice as much code to do a feature when I could just build the feature? It didn't make sense to me. 
So I just said I'm not going to do it. Had a lot of resistance to writing unit testing in the beginning. Eventually came around when I saw just how catastrophic a bug that was really easy to catch would be if you shipped it to the client. Came back, started writing unit tests. Everything improved from there. Started teaching other people how to write unit tests. Everything was great. And then got wrote back into WordPress and looked at the pile of stuff that WordPress was and said, wow, we need some unit tests. And everybody said, but you can't test PHP. It's not really testable. 2007, we didn't have PHP unit. We didn't have unit testing tools for PHP. WordPress didn't have unit tests. You had to build your entire test framework first before you could write a test, which would mean you would have to completely rebuild WordPress from scratch in order to test WordPress. Nobody was going to do that. We just completely ignored it. So WordPress continued to carry on, carry on, carry on. PHP unit came around. People started going back and trying to test WordPress. And then they realized you had two very different communities. The professional, professional world writing unit tests thought about writing code a specific way. They used fancy, acronym, fancy terms like dependency injection, dependency inversion to figure out how they could make their code completely decoupled so you could test literally one component at a time. If you guys are really familiar with WordPress, you know that we use globals everywhere. WordPress, at its core, originally was completely untestable. Nothing was object-oriented. You couldn't create a post object and actually use that, because a post was just an array of different items that may or may not be defined, depending on where you grab the post inside WordPress. Themes were not object-oriented. WordPress itself was not object-oriented. The database object said it was an object. It had a constructor that would create the object, one big function called run, and that was it. It was WordPress trying to be object oriented. I actually went back a couple of years ago and tried to unit test the database class, and I still can't sleep because of that. It's, it's not very well written. It's just like I said, everything came from a big mess of spaghetti. A lot of people who were self taught engineers going to conferences where you only paid $20 to learn all you could know trying to help themselves succeed. Luckily, because PHP is ubiquitous on the internet, WordPress has been insanely successful. It also means we've pulled people back from the professional sphere into WordPress who have helped the WordPress community grow up in a sense, learn how to do object-oriented programming, learn how to use dependency injection, learn how to write unit tests. So it was not the best of code. It wasn't necessarily the worst of code because it did run. 10% of the internet is nothing to bad an eye at. Now we're almost to 30% of the internet. It's grown considerably since then. But things have changed a lot over the past few years. The truth about WordPress and testing, though, is even though now we do have tests, not many people do it. Who here has ever written a unit test? Who here has written a unit test for WordPress code, a plugin, or a theme? Who has written a test for WordPress core? I, I rest my case. Not many people test. One of the reasons why not pe many people test is not many people know what to test. A lot of times when we're working with our code, you sit down and we actually used a really good example with my team a couple of weeks ago when we had our on-site, the entire company got together and met. Another coll a colleague of mine and I stood up and actually led a unit testing workshop for our entire team. And we started with a post type registration. And we walked through and we had every single component of post type registration broken up into its own function inside a class. All of the labels were returned by a function. All of the options were returned by a function. All of the capabilities were returned by a function. And then we had a register function that called all of those subsequent functions inside register post type. We were then able to test each component by itself. Everything was really smooth. Unit tests were very simple. We ended up writing less code for the unit test than we did for the actual class that we were testing, and still had 100% code coverage in, in this project. And everybody sat there and said, wow, this is really great. This is a really good academic thing. This makes a lot of sense. Why don't we unit test? I'm like, OK, who writes their code like this? And everybody just kind of sat there and stared at me. I'm like, OK, well, on the next slide, this is how you all write your code. And we put up a slide that listed how everybody normally registers a post type in a function, maybe namespace, where all of this work is all done inside one function. Labels are created, options are created, capabilities are created, translations are triggered, and then the post type is registered. And I looked at that function where we had to scroll two different screens to get everything on the, on the projector and said, OK, who writes their code like this? Every single hand went up. Who wants to test code like this? Every single hand went right back down. And I said, that is why we don't test. When we're focused on the problem, we try to solve the problem as quickly as we can 
can with as little effort as possible because frankly developers are lazy we like to do stuff really quick we don't like to expend a lot of energy so it's very easy to just say I'll just throw this stuff in here and fix it later Wh who's ever said that I'll just write this code this way and then I'll fix it later keep your hand up if you've ever, ever actually gone back to fix it Okay, you, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Not many people ever do that, and that's how we get mounted technical debt in our applications. There are parts of WordPress that actually have comments in the code from six years ago that say we need to rewrite this, and nobody's gone back to rewrite it. There, there are bugs on track right now that are 10 years old. WordPress is only about 11 and a half. There are bugs that are 10 years old where people basically said, well, it works now, we have a hacky workaround, we'll fix it in the next release. That bug's been open for 10 years kind of shows how quickly we come back to it. The thing is, WordPress really emphasizes testing now. Over the past few years, we've added a lot of really sophisticated tests to WordPress. There are a lot of tools that I'm going to go over in a second that allow us to test literally everything inside of WordPress. As a matter of fact, if you find a bug in WordPress today, and you want to contribute code to patch your bug, and you contribute a patch and it does not have tests, it will not be accepted. It will sit there on track until somebody, until either you write the test or somebody else writes the test. No new code goes into WordPress unless it is completely covered by unit tests. And that's just the way that we're doing things now. We're catching up with the, the professional world, so to speak, and we're making sure that our application is safe, secure, stable, and that no unexpected behavior is going to come up. The nice thing about WordPress is that there are now actually two ways you can test your code. We're going to go over the two different test suites that people are using these days, explain the differences of each, and how they can actually play a part in your infrastructure in the, in the way that you're working on projects. The first one is the core test framework. This is something that doesn't really ship with WordPress core, but you can check out the development repository for WordPress core, and you get the core test suite with it. Lots of test cases already there covers a lot of what goes on behind the scenes in WordPress. We aren't at 100% code coverage just because we haven't gone back to backfill all of the code inside of WordPress. A lot of times when we start saying we need to add test coverage to this component of WordPress, we really mean we need to replace this component of WordPress with something that's not a piece of crap because most of WordPress started out that way. Like I said, posts used to just literally be an associative array. You would have an array and you'd say array bracket ID, array, bracket, post name, and everything else to pull all of the properties out of a post. Now, a post is a WP post object. It's an object with a bunch of magic methods that allow you to get and set properties, the ID, the post title, the post name, the post content, dynamically invoke filters to make sure the post content is sanitized, that the post name, rather than the post title, is something that actually works as a key in a database and something that works as a URL slug for your permalinks. In addition to that, the WP post object has a magic getter and setter that allows you to dynamically interact with post meta on the post object as if it is a part of the post itself. So you don't have to call get post meta to actually go out to the database and query it. You can just say get post and then post arrow my custom meta field. And WordPress automatically knows how to retrieve, retrieve that from the database and cache it inside the post object so you don't have to be making redundant queries and it's completely covered by tests. So it's completely stable, it's reliable, you're not gonna have to worry about it. The core test framework was originally created in 2011. Shortly after PHP unit came around, everybody tried to see, okay, how can we force this on top of WordPress? And it was baby steps. There, there was some parts of WordPress core that we could actually test because people who had, in a past life, worked for Oracle or Cisco or one of the, the big enterprise level companies came to WordPress as they were maintaining their blog or their, their personal website and said, hey, I really want to test this feature. And they'd write the feature in such a way that it could be tested even though they didn't write the tests. Those features made it really easy to come back in and now that we have a test framework, let's test these components. 2011, Nikolai put together this test framework, threw it up on GitHub and said, here you go guys, let's use this. It was a really cool project. We actually started, we started our own track for the test framework so that people could continue to contribute to it. We had our own factories for dynamically creating mock posts so that you could create a fake post, fake taxa taxonomy terms, and all the different pieces of WordPress so you could actually test them without having to create all of these posts. 
But after a while, we realized that maintaining two completely separate repositories was kind of a nightmare. Who has ever had to do that? You have two different repositories for the same project. You might be using a sub-module. You, you might have to do merges across multiple team members, across multiple states of the repositories. Who, who's done that and still remains sane? <laughs> I see some shaky hands. That, that's really hard. It's really messy. It's kind of a pain. So in 2012, we merged the test framework with Core. If you check out the development repository now, you get everything. You get all of WordPress. You get all of the grunt scripts that will dynamically concatenate together JavaScript files and style sheets. I think we're using SAS now for some of our CSS pre preprocessing. All of that stuff will run. And you get the entire test suite so that you can run everything inside the WordPress system on your computer. The one caveat here is by being able to test the whole everything that is in WordPress, you have to test the whole everything that is in WordPress. The core test framework, when it runs, it takes a database, deletes everything, populates it with a known state, runs through a bunch of code, and then drops the database at the end of the test run. So you, this is not something you run in production. It's not something you run against production data. I am speaking from experience. <laughs> My first website that I built in WordPress, I do not have anymore because I figured, huh, what happens when I run test in this directory? I learned very quickly that that's also why you maintain multiple redundant offsite backups. But you will get an end-to-end -end test of the entire WordPress stack, everything from the beginning to the top, everything from MySQL to the output in HTML is tested by the WordPress test framework. Complete coverage. To give you an idea of what some of the tests look like, the core test framework inherits from a WP, WP test case. PHP unit has its own PHP unit test case class that you write all of your tests inside. WordPress subclasses that as a WP test case. This gives you the ability to use things like mock action, to use object factories. You can create a user and return the user and then run tests against a fake user. And what all of these factories do, so if you create a post with the post factory or a user with the user factory, it actually goes to the database and creates that post or creates that user so that when you call get user or get post, it actually returns that data back from a MySQL query. Another caveat there is we often run into race conditions with some of our code. If you're trying to run your code too quickly, I've seen some cases where you can run the test framework, everything passes. Press enter and run it again, some of the tests fail. Press enter and run it again, everything passes. And in some cases, that's because we're writing content to the database and then running another test where we're trying to read that data back out before MySQL has released the lock on the database record. So you can have a couple of different things going on. There's just something to be aware of when you're working with the core test framework. This test class is just to test an action. So we create a mock action so that we don't have to register the entire WordPress action setup. We're going to give it a name, and then we're going to call add action to add this, this test action to our system. And then we call do action. Typical WordPress infrastructure, you use add action to add a hook. You use do action to invoke the hook. Then we verify our assertions below that. We're going to make sure that that action was called. Call count is 1. We're then going to make sure that that action was called with the tag we expected it to be called with, which should be test action. And you can see that's what we're calling do action with. Then we're going to grab the arguments that this action was invoked with. And then we're going to make sure that the arguments array actually looks like what we expected it to be. This kind of test can be really, really powerful because with the action framework, other code can be adding actions in places that we don't expect it to. Some cases I've seen different hosting providers and different people setting up servers add a dynamic PHP include script that is included before WordPress is ever invoked. And sometimes that PHP include script, if it's written really poorly, can affect the way actions work. So when you're testing the entire infrastructure and you're trying to get a true integration test of WordPress with every component that you're going to have in production, being able to test all of that code in one place and make sure that even simple tests like this pass is what gives you the confidence to write your code in the WordPress way and actually move forward with it like you normally would. Once again, like I said, everything is tested with this test framework, top to bottom. Every time you create a user, create a post, create a taxonomy term, it is written to the database and then pulled back out of the database. One thing to keep in mind is if you're creating posts, in WordPress, you can't control the IDs of the posts that you create. So in some cases, you might be writing a test kit and say, I'm going to create a post with an ID of 5. 
well, that, that's great. If you're telling the database, I want you to create a post with an ID of five, it'll say, I really don't care what you think. You've already used that ID. Here's your post back with an ID of 3,027. So everything's tested end to end. You need to write your code the exact same way you would in a WordPress world where you don't have control over the IDs, you need to get the IDs dynamically back from the database. This is true for posts, for users, taxonomy terms, everything that you have that has an automatically incrementing ID inside the database will still have an automatically incrementing ID inside the WordPress core test framework. That's one limitation, just something to be aware of as you guys actually get out there and use it. Because a lot of times when you're writing tests, you want to make sure that your code is completely isolated from the database. WordPress core test framework is an integration test. All of the different components working together in concert. Unit testing, you'd need something like WP Mock, which is a tool originally created by myself and a couple of other engineers back in 2013 to address that specific problem with the WordPress core test framework that we did not want to have WordPress there when we tested our code. We wanted to be able to test get title or get the title without actually calling get the title. We also wanted to be able to create a post with a specific ID because in some cases, certain IDs were actually triggering errors in our code. We originally adopted this as just a component that we use at 10up for all of our engineering. We also used it ex extensively with TechCrunch. TechCrunch.com uses WP Mock to test their entire system. I think we had like 85% code coverage the last time I actually ran a code coverage report, which is incredibly high for a dynamic WordPress theme. Once again, it tests all of the code completely independent of WordPress. And the reason for this was A, to get around some of those dynamic variables, and B, to get around just the, the weirdness of some of the functions and how they have to actually integrate with a database or with a remote service. If you're testing a function that has to make a call out to Twitter to send a tweet, you don't want your code to actually call out to Twitter to send a tweet. Because then you end up with a bunch of weird issues like I had where everything TechCrunch was tweeting was showing up in my personal profile because we hadn't turned things off. Another example is if you're testing the way posts are being created, the way posts are being, let's say, synchronized with a service like SwiftType, which is a um, search service, you want to be able to turn off that integration but still test your code, which means you don't necessarily want that integration to be there. You want a fake implementation of that integration to be there. Otherwise, you run into situations where the production search page starts showing test something, test something else, test this other thing when people Google search or Google test on that production website in the cloud. Not saying that happened, although it did, but it, it's kind of embarrassing when stuff like that happens. You want to be able to take yourself as far away from the APIs that you rely on as you can. The other, like a sandbox. Yeah, like a sandbox. And WP Mock gives you the ability, basically, you don't have a database. So you don't have to worry about the database. So you can say, create a post with an ID of five. It doesn't actually do anything. It just says, yeah, you've got a post with an ID of five. Here's the object reference. You can now pass that around like you would any other WP post. And thanks to WP Mock and the tools that it's built upon, if you try to check the type of that object you've just created, it will be a WP post object. You can actually have all of the objects. So as far as your code is concerned, it's still running WordPress. In reality, it's not. The advantage here is TechCrunch and other sites that use this project. I can clone the theme onto my local machine and run the code immediately. I only have PHP on my machine. I don't have MySQL. I don't have any of the other components that you need to actually make WordPress want, run. I don't have a web server, none of that. I just have PHP, and I can take TechCrunch's theme and a bunch of other themes, pull them onto my site, onto my laptop, and run the entire test suite with no issues. Everything will run to, run to completion, and I'll be able to verify the code works. This is great for working with a distributed team, because sometimes I will have to hop onto another project quickly just to help out with an issue. Other people will have to hop onto other projects quickly to help with an issue. They might not have the time that it takes to actually set up the full WordPress stack, pull in the theme, pull in content, make sure things work. They just need to fix a bug really quickly. With WP Mock, they can pull in the content and see, here's the bug. You need to make sure that you're filtering out this one ID that doesn't fit. Here's the code that fixes that. Here you go. Everything passes. Make sure that this actually works in staging and actually fixes your bug. The reason why I keep mentioning the ID is, is a lot of our sites at 10up run on WordPress.com VIP where they have a basically a gigantic multi-site that runs all of WordPress.com. 
which means if you have a user account on your personal blog on WordPress.com, you technically have a user account on every other site on WordPress.com in existence. You just don't have permission to access those sites. But that means that I cannot control the user IDs that are being present in my code. So if I'm trying to code up a page that is only going to be present for myself and two other engineers for testing and production, I need to know our specific user IDs so I can say basically, if user is 52,524, show this page. Otherwise, don't show anything. You can't do that in WordPress core test framework unless you sit there and basically write a loop that's going to add that many users to the database before you can test your code. Another reason why it's useful to mock, yes? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt your point, but uh, do you have a unit test suite for the accuracy of WP mock to the actual core? Do we have a unit test suite for the accuracy of WP mock to WordPress core? No. The reason for that is WP mock does not implement core. I'll show you on another slide how WPMock does this magic, but basically in your code, you document what parts of the WordPress API your code relies on, and you use WPMock to mock those components of WordPress core. So if you depend on, I'll show you a more specific example, but if you depend on get the ID to return a post ID, if you ret rely on get post, inside your test, you actually define the behavior of get the ID and define the behavior of get post. And then your code calls your versions of those functions because it doesn't have WordPress to rely on. So you can actually s set up your you define not just the dependency, but the specific functional dependency. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, the other advantage of WP mock comes in specifically with non-same. Who here has worked with crypto the cryptographic nonces inside WordPress core? Okay, for those of you who don't know what they are, a cryptographic nonce is a number used once. It is a way that you can authenticate a user-specific action inside WordPress core. So when you're on a page, let's say the post edit screen, and you have all of those buttons that say delete post, delete post, delete post, every single one of those buttons has a nonce assigned to that post. That nonce identifies the post ID, your user ID, and the action that you want to take. So if you're user number five and it's post ID 10 and you want to delete the post, it has those three components coded into this cryptographic number that is then assigned to that link. This then means that nobody else can pretend that they're you and click that link because that nonce is also tied to your specific authenticated session within WordPress. So if I log into my site on my computer and I log into my site on your computer, I can look at the exact same page and I will have a different nonce on your computer than my computer. So even if you're somehow able to figure out I want to use Eric's ID to delete this post, you don't have my session, you can't actually spoof my nonce. It's a security feature inside WordPress that prevents people from basically bypassing security checks and hacking your site. The other thing about nonces is they're time-based. They expire after 12 hours. They're valid for 24, but every 12 hours that action will create a new nonce. So that somebody, let's say, somehow intercepts the traffic on my computer and sees that I had a link with the nonce to delete a post criticizing some political campaign that they don't want criticized. They might steal my traffic over SSL, run it through supercomputers, spend a bunch of time cracking it, and eventually get the code and see what my nonce was. If it takes them three days, it doesn't matter. That nonce is no longer valid. WordPress rejects it entirely. So it gives you a time-based lockout to prevent people from trying to do replay attacks and try to replay old nonces to authenticate past behavior. The downside is testing nonces. Everything is built using PHP's time function, which is great, right? Except you cannot mock, you cannot rewrite, you cannot override PHP core functionality. So if you have code that depends on a nonce inside WordPress, and you need to verify that after 24 hours that nonce is invalid, when you click run in your test suite, you can go fishing at the beach for, for the rest of the day because it will take 24 hours to run your test through to completion. With a tool like WP Mock, you can atomically define every invocation of this verify nonce function. So verify the nonce now? Yeah, it's verified. Then you can change the behavior of that nonce verification routine to simulate what's going to happen in 12 hours. Now verify it again. It's still valid, it's just old. Okay, now modify the function to say it's been 24 hours, now verify again, it's invalid. Your test suite now runs in three milliseconds rather than 24 hours. 
And that, that is a specific example I've used in the past with authentication. I actually had an API where tokens were valid for 15 minutes. And before we actually mocked the timing infrastructure underlying that, it would take 15 to 30 minutes to run the test suite every time you ran it. If you can only run your test suite every, once every 30 minutes, it will not be run more frequently than once every 30 minutes, which means if you work an eight hour day, you're only running your test suite at most 16 times a day, and I guarantee you, you're not running it immediately every 30 minutes. You want your test to be run after every change as quickly as you can, as much as you can, so mocking those kinds of dependencies makes it easier to actually move forward and test your code more frequently. Now to give you an example of what I said about using WP mock, and this is an example of a WP mock capable function. So we're testing a function called trim excerpt, and we're going to do a couple of things. We're using a tool called mockery to create a fake instance of WP post. So it's going to be an object that looks and behaves exactly like WP post, but we can control every piece about it. We can control its ID, its title, even the dynamic magic getter, magic, magic setter, and all of the other functions therein. We're then going to create, a, create an excerpt and just cache that because we're going to use that in our verification. And we're going to set the post excerpt to, this is an excerpt with a line break. We're then going to store our mock post in the global post object because WordPress does use global posts and our trim the excerpt function references global post. We're then actually going to use WP mock, which is where you see the M colon colon. M is just an alias for WP mock to cut down on the number of characters on the screen. In this case, we're defining a WP function called get the content. And we say we don't ever want this to be called. Because basically, we're verifying that our function, our trim excerpt function, is never calling the content. It's only ever talking to the excerpt. We then create a pass-through function. A pass-through function is just a way to tell the framework, give me back whatever I just gave you. And in this case, we're defining strip shortcodes. It's going to be called once. It's going to be called with the excerpt that we just defined. And it's just going to give us back our, our excerpt. Basically, it's not going to actually strip tags. We define another pass-through pass -through function, trim characters, trim by characters with XML. It's going to be called once. It's going to be called with excerpt and stripping BR and a bunch of other stuff, with it, which is just inside our function that we know, it's, we know how it's working. And because it's a pass-through function, it's just going to return what we gave it. And then at the bottom, we assert that our excerpt that we started with at the top and the return of trim excerpt, which is the function we're testing, that they're both the same. And assert conditions met just verifies that get the content was never called, strip short because it was called once, and trim by characters with HTML was called once. When this test is run, it is run in isolation. You can run this test by itself. Nothing exists except for this code and that function trim excerpt. Nothing else is defined. There are no functions in the namespace because we are explicitly saying we know we need to use get the content, or we know we don't want to use get the content, but it might be called by this function. We know that we need to use strip short codes, and we know that we need to use this custom user namespace function trim by characters with HTML. In reality, none of those functions are defined inside trim excerpt, but it invokes all of them. So what you do is when you're writing your test, you clearly spell out in your doc block at the beginning of your function what its dependencies are. So if you've seen a doc block, they have an at uses parameter. You can say at uses strip shortcode, at uses trim by characters with HTML. And then that tells the engineer writing the test, these are my dependencies. These are the functions in the WordPress API that I'm using. These are the functions that I need to mock the behavior of inside my test because they want to exist when I call this function. So once again, it just tests whatever you want it to test. It does not test WordPress itself. It doesn't even load the WordPress API. Like I said before, I can use Git to actually clone down a copy of a theme and test that theme by itself without WordPress, without a database, without a web server, with no other components installed on my machine, just that theme. The advantage there is that you are completely separate from WordPress. You do have to rely on WordPress doing what WordPress says it's going to do. But at the same time, that's the risk you take whenever you build on any framework. Even the WordPress unit tests don't test PHP. They don't test Nginx. They don't touch, test Apache. You just have to take, take for granted that the foundational architecture upon which you're building is actually stable, is actually reliable, and that they are running their own tests and making sure that their API matches their documentation. 
So when you talk about implementations, Core's test framework is really meant for testing Core. You can use it for testing some other things, but it's really built to test WordPress Core and everything there that that entails. The other advantage of the Core Test Framework is it gives you full integration testing. So on the one hand, you want to make sure that your code is actually fulfilling all of your assumptions and all of your expectations and meeting every single requirement that you need it to meet by itself. But then you might run into situations where you know that it needs to do certain things with WordPress Core and make sure that there are certain pieces that actually interact together in a reliable way. And that's where you might add core test framework support to your plugin, to your theme, which gives you the full ability for full integration testing. One of the things that Andrew Nason, who's one of the lead developers for WordPress, talked about at LoopConf recently was how the recent 4.2 multi-byte character support in WordPress was actually patching a security vulnerability. And that was a security vulnerability where if you actually were to, let's say, submit a comment or post content or anything to WordPress that contained a multi-byte character, MySQL, because of the character encoding and table collation that we were actually using for WordPress, MySQL would truncate everything after that character. So you could take the first part of, let's say, a JavaScript cross-site scripting attack, chop off the first half, put a multi-byte character, put whatever junk you want after that, submit that as a comment. If you've commented before, it gets automatically approved, shows up, MySQL truncates everything after your multi-byte comment. You then come back maybe a week or two later, post the second half of the JavaScript exploit. Because of the way the scripts were actually working, everything would be ignored in between the two and it would run as a single unified JavaScript exploit on your browser and you could inadvertently let somebody into your machine because of that. That's also something that comes up in some themes because you might have a theme where you're building a custom search page that's going to be doing something similar with presenting a search query or presenting search terms or pulling something out of the database and actually showing that content. You might test your theme completely in isolation, might be fine in isolation. But then because of the way WordPress and MySQL is truncating content with different encodings on characters, you might have bugs in your code because that's not something you can really expect. It's something you rely on WordPress to do. It might also be something that you're not necessarily expecting WordPress to do. You might be running WordPress in a way where you expected multi-byte character support to be present. Let's say you're running a multi-language blog in Southeast Asia. You need multi-byte character support, otherwise things just won't work. You could test multi-byte character support in your theme. That's great. But your theme is not the one storing that content in the database. That's WordPress. So then you pull in WordPress core test framework, add a couple of full integration tests, and just make sure that when people submit content or titles or a blog name that has multi-byte characters encoded in it, that everything actually makes it to the database and then comes back and is presented properly in your theme. We've actually dealt with some situations with clients who have had not multi-byte characters, but just different encodings on different machines because people work in different regions. One person would write content, store it in a post, save, everything's fine. Another person would load the content, change the title, save, and have everything be corrupted because their machine loaded the loaded the text, re-encoded it, stored it as the new encoding, and the person who originally wrote the article could no longer read it because all of the encoding was broken. That kind of edge behavior is where you need a full integration test. Integration test suites are much more limited than unit test suites. Unit test suites should test everything. Every line of code in your application should be covered. Integration tests are testing specific cases. What happens when I add an emoji character in a blog post title? Is that going to be stored properly in the WordPress database? And is that going to be present, presented properly inside my code when it actually comes back? And are we going to be able to work together? WP Mock, Mockery, and similar tools like that are for testing your plugins and themes. Once again, every line of code should be covered. Everything is available. You have the entire API there. You have the ability to have full code coverage. Even in places where you're outputting HTML to the browser, you can still test expectations with that HTML. You can verify that it contains certain tags. You can verify that it has certain tags in certain orders, that certain tags have certain attributes and meta information about them. You can actually verify all of those expectations and reach full code coverage, once again, without even needing WordPress to be available. The other advantage, both of these frameworks are free. I put free in, in scare quotes because as somebody once told me, don't use the, the analogy free as in beer, use the analogy in they're free as in a puppy. They're free, you can use them, they're great, but they require a lot of work. 
Unit testing requires work to understand what you're doing. It requires a different way of thinking when you're writing your code. It's no longer the days where you can just be lazy and say, I'll just throw this code in here and it'll work. Great, it will, but if your code becomes very long, if your code starts to have hidden dependencies, global variables, it depends on global state, you have additional things you need to mock and additional things you need to take into account when you're actually building your application, when you're testing your code. One example that a friend of mine gave me when he was talking about code review, I, I asked him, how long should code be? How, how long should a code review be? And he said, if it's longer than this, it's too long. And he literally stood there and said, if it's longer than this, it's too long. When it comes to writing your code, when you're building a theme, a plugin, writing quote, code for WordPress core, whatever, if your function does not fit on one screen of your IDE at a reasonable text size, it's too big. It's doing too much. Don't make your font size like two-point font and say, hey, it all fits. I've seen people actually do that, try to use that for justification. I'm currently working on a system where somehow one function has ballooned to over 1,500 lines of code in a single function. We looked at that and somebody said, write unit test for it. And we all stared at it and we're like, no, we're, we're rewriting the function. Because we need to extract a bunch of functionality because there are just too many states. When I do unit testing workshops and walk people through how to do unit tests, I talk about drawing logic diagrams and flowcharts. How many people here still draw flowcharts for their code when they write code? How many people are going to after I finish today's talk? There you go. The advantage with writing a flowchart is you can walk through the execution of your code. You, know, you have an input. Based on that input, you're going to go down different branches. As you draw out your tree, you're going to have different endpoints where the tree stops. Every place where the tree stops should be a different test. If you have more than four for one function, that means your function is doing way more than it needs to. I've seen one, one code where somebody was trying to do a bunch of really bright things. They had three nested ternary operations, which is where you have the if, question mark, this, colon, else. They had three nested ternary operators inside a like five level Boolean branch. We had him draw out his, his logical diagram and it took six whiteboards. And he looked at it and he said, so I can test this, right? No, don't even try. It just becomes a nightmare once you get to a certain point. So as you write your code, the, the tools are free. They're free to use. They're available. WP Mock is MIT licensed, which is as permissive as we can get. It's basically do whatever you want. Just make sure you leave the name on it when you use the tool. The WordPress core test framework, like WordPress itself, is GPL. So once again, you can do whatever you want. You just have to have your subsequent code also be GPL. So if you're extending the test framework for your own test suite, your test suite becomes GPL, which is one of the reasons why WP Mock is MIT. You can do whatever you want with it. We don't care. Just use it. Have fun. But it will take effort to learn it. It will take effort to work with it. And if you find a bug, please contribute back. They're both open source. Uh, the WordPress core test framework is on track. It's part of WordPress core, so you can always contribute bugs and reports and fixes there. WP Mock is on GitHub. Once again, everything's open to pull requests or feature requests or just questions as we move forward. Yes? So now we have to learn it's hard. What's the quickest, most efficient way to learn how to do this? The quickest and most efficient way to learn how to do this is to look at the way WordPress core is already doing it. WordPress core was a great learning tool back in 2006, 2007 when it was a mess. It's an even better learning tool today now that it's much cleaner code and it is a well-tested code base. What about Mock? How do you do that? WP Mock, we're working on tutorials for that. There are a few examples on the WP Mock GitHub page. I would say just take a look at it, um, start with the WordPress core test framework. Basically, WP Mock is just a way where you can create a fake function without having WordPress there. So there are some examples on the site. We're adding more to the wiki. If you have specific questions or anything like that, feel free to just open an issue. Basically, anything, when you look at WP Mock, if there's anything that you don't understand about it, that means that's a bug and we aren't communicating well. So if you have a question, your question is a bug report to us, and we can make it better. On WP Mock, you just need PHP. Uh, WP Mock is a Composer module, so you can actually use Composer to install it. The cool thing about Composer is you can use PHP to install Composer, and then you can use Composer to install WP Mock PHP unit and everything else. 
So once again, my name is Eric Mann. I'm a lead web engineer at 10up. We are always hiring, so feel free and come and talk to me if you have any questions about that. At Eric Mann on Twitter, eaman.com is my personal portfolio site, and it has links to my blog, which have additional tutorials and work as well. I do work for 10up. We've got some cool engineers and some cool projects and even cooler code. And I think we have about three minutes for questions. Yes? I run Okay, do I have an experience with failed tests in WordPress core? Like, yes, straight out of the box without changing anything. Do you set up a database for it? I have seen a lot of failed tests, usually not too many. Uh, WordPress core, when you pull that down, you're usually testing trunk, which isn't necessarily always the most stable. If you pull down a stable tag, you should be able to run it without tests. So, as an example, you have to pull down 4.2, 4.2 mm -hmm. tags, and it came back saying, with errors saying that the sub library is supposed to be at 4.2.3, and I'm not sure how to know whether the tests are like it. Okay, so the tests themselves are likely reliable. Maybe if the accuser needs to issue, um, just because sometimes the tests require a higher version of the than what the itself does. It might be your machine, or it might be legitimately we have bugs in the test framework. Okay, maybe they are Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's okay, absolutely. Okay, yeah, we can take a look after this, no problems. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you very much. Hope you guys have a great rest of the day.